So we have got a wonderful session of panelists uh, who lead from different industries talking about how CEOs who are always at the hem of innovation, how they are leading the change and thinking about the new. So I'll first start with Radhika. Radhika, what are your views on innovation? Do you think in today's time when we discuss about the new normal, the meaning of innovation has changed in the last two years? So I think innovation is not, uh, you know, unidimensional. Innovation has always existed. But I think when we have talked about innovation in most of our industries, at least mine, it has often been in the context of product innovation, uh, you know, um, at least in an industry like ours. And I think that that continues to be there. I mean, you know, you have to be innovative be in product and channel, etc. But I think COVID has also taught us that there's much more in the name of innovation. I think uh, workplaces, for instance, and the way we deal with people is perhaps the area that has seen the most innovation in the last two, three years. I mean, the fact is, look, we're sitting here and we're doing a panel like this. Uh, which is effectively a hybrid format panel. Uh, you have one guest who's sitting on the dais and you have two of us joining virtually. Um, I, I am the mother of a recently born two-month-old and uh, in an old era, I would have not been able to do this panel. I was not traveling. But, uh, you know, here we've got an innovative approach to communication. So I think the lens that we look at, uh, you know, with innovation has changed and has widened. Um, and, you know, the kind of innovation that we are trying to focus on is innovation in the way we hire, for instance, over the last two, three years, ours is a talent industry. Talent has been a crunch. Uh, talent has been very, very expensive. So can we differentiate and hire very, very differently? Can we have new models to hire? Uh, talent in the way, uh, innovation in the way we market. So I think a lot of innovation comes, uh, you know, in that. Area. The second point I would want to make on innovation is, you know, over the last three years, I've sort of developed a strange dislike for the word innovation in the context of financial services, because it has come to be associated with complexity. Um, and I truly believe that innovation that is powerful is innovation that is useful to a consumer. Um, so, Anything that is simple and solves a consumer problem at scale is innovative. And I think in a country like India, the need of the hour is not complex third order innovation, especially in financial services. The need of the hour is simple things that create impact at scale. I mean, you live in a country where a prime minister is still asking people to open bank accounts. So innovation is powerful when it happens simply and with scale. So. I think uh, a culture of useful innovation is also important. Sure. Ankit, coming to you, what are your views on innovation and has it changed its meaning in the last two years? Yeah, firstly, thank you uh, for having me on this panel. Um, and uh, my apologies for not being there in person. Uh, I, I want to just say a few things. I think one is, uh, you know, uh, my own view is that, you know, the next 10, 15 years is, you know, India's time. Um, it's just incredible, incredible opportunity for, uh, you know, India to leap forward to a first world country. And, uh, you know, it's really on, on all of us and all the entrepreneurs and, and all the people uh, who are present to, to make that happen. It's not for someone else to find a way. Um, and really in that, then uh, one of the critical parts is, is innovation. However, you, you know, you describe it. Um, uh, for me personally, uh, you know, I've seen on the manufacturing side, there's a real opportunity to take Indian technology products uh, and compete with the best in the world. I'm extremely proud uh, that we make these uh, unique uh, products, which uh, provide essentially broadband uh, to over 120 countries. We're probably one of few companies in the world who've done that and we've invested heavily in R&D. We have, you know, massive R&D centers all over the world and with 750 patents. So my point is, it's not so much about STL, but to, to believe that, you know, such, uh, such solutions are possible in India with our own talent and we can compete like for like. I mean, one of the things we always talk about is can we compete on quality? We've been able to compete on, on, on price or cost, but not necessarily always on quality and innovation. And I just want to reassure everyone there that that is very much possible, um, you know, and it's really important for entrepreneurs uh, who are sitting there to also believe that it's not always just about getting to the lowest cost. Yes, you have to be cost competitive, 
but i think in in this world you have to have to focus on quality mm-hmm. focus on customer experience and i think that's a big part that we are differentiating on um i think really linked to covid but also prior to that few things that we decided to uh, to do differently one was uh, how we put esg front and center rather than a tick in the box about you know the 2% um we are uh, as of last week the only company in the world to be certified zero waste to landfill across our operations around the world that is my first opening slide to my every customer around the world it's not how big we are it's not what product i have is that we are the most sustainable company in the world and people are shocked that indian company even cares about it more so leading the world about it so that's an example of innovation where customer says wow i want to be with you because uh, because you're leading the charge I mean, on uh, on sustainability the second part we've done in terms of innovation is actually built a very unique platform um to uh, what we saw because of the supply chain disruption disruptions around the world one of the biggest challenges our customers had was just visibility on demand almost like amazon of where their goods were at any point of time um and so we said about doing that there was no one platform that we could use we actually got startups large companies all together in a room and we actually created first of its kind platform that when a good leaves my factory to indian port to a ship to a us port to uh, to the customer all of that can be tracked on demand by the customer so these are just examples that i'm sharing in terms of where where we looked at innovation um and i fully agree with what radhika said ultimately it comes down to how are you improving the customer experience and every time we found ways to do that the customer values you and wants to stick with you so i think that's that's how i see it it certainly got an accelerated uh by uh, covid and i would really encourage the entrepreneurs to think outside of the box to create that customer experience sure sure thank you ankit we'll come back to both of you during the discussion Rupesh, coming to you, how TeamViewer as a company looks at innovation because digital transformation is something we have all been talking about, and in the last two two and a half years, it has surely taken a leap. So, what are your your views on this? Sure. So, if you look at uh, innovation, you know, for me uh, or for us as TeamViewer, it's more being relevant, you know, to the current times. Okay, uh, we have seen. changing environments every day and uh, you know what is it that you can do to simplify the life of your customer okay and what all areas if you operate can help them simplify business is re- innovation for us you know case in point um, very simply put is uh, it cannot be in every area you know just it's not a whims and fancy that you know let's go and innovate but the first thing that we look at is where is it really required so what is the problem statement so identifying areas where there are opportunities to improve and then thinking of building solutions you know in those areas uh, those kind of innovations really uh, you know get you where you want to be you know in business or uh, uh, you know with business with customers or within your organization from an improvement standpoint so when we studied and researched the market we realized that you know 80% people in an enterprise are actually people who are not on systems right so what do we do to get the information that these people who are sitting in working in plants in warehouses or on the field servicing uh, the machines that you would have sold you know how do you get the information to them so the innovation is where you know we were able to create a platform to which could be used by the 80% of the people you know otherwise it was more used by people who are sitting in our office so you know such you know enabled changes you know really lead to innovation and that's what we are doing at team viewer where we are now able to get the 80% of employees or members in your team who are not on the systems the data or access to the data to simplify their work okay interesting so i want to next from all of you since uh, as ceos you are in charge of uh, that innovation ecosystem but uh, you're also responsible for the pnl of the company so how do you maintain a fine balance in terms of 
how overboard can you go in terms of uh, launching a new innovation in the entire organization and also keeping an eye on the profitability or the shareholder margin. Radhika, I would like to ask you this first. You know, I, I'll, I'll start with an example, I think, that uh, leads well to profitability. Uh, we launched a product called Bharat Bond ETF with Government of India three years ago. Um, and it is, uh, it is an extremely innovative product. It solves a consumer problem by being a tax efficient replacement to FD. Uh, now, it is it was a no margin product at that point in time. Um, and so there was a lot of criticism from at least peers around us, etc., that we were going to launch a no margin product and there was a certain amount of marketing and spend. So, and we were a loss making company uh, back in the day. Um, we, however, firmly felt that the investment was worth it uh, because we could build a franchise, because we would acquire customers. Uh, today, that franchise is 50,000 crores. Because we were able to succeed with that, we were able to launch a bunch of products on the back of that that were fee earning. So I think the short answer is that if you are doing something that adds value to the consumer, uh, if you are able to then monetize those consumers, and I also know that uh, we live in times where business models are under question and profitability is under question. So if you are able to monetize, acquire consumers and then eventually monetize consumers, uh, then I think innovation can be very, very profitable. So that is the way that we think about innovation in the context of our industry. Uh, in financial services, I do feel, and in asset management, the cost of failure is reasonably low. So our model for innovation is to try often, uh, and the team often asks what if we fail. If there is no regulatory cost of failure, and if there is no damage to the brand, then we are okay to uh, invest. We are also quick to cut losses, however. So if something is not working and we're not getting the feedback, then we stop investing in the area. So the pace of innovation is do a lot because the cost of investment is usually low. Um, and, uh, you know, go from there as long as there's not any regulatory risk. And once in a while, a sort of game-changing opportunity like Bharat Pond comes out. As I, as I said at the beginning, I truly believe that in any industry, if you do the right thing for the consumer, um, you will find a way to make money on it. Sure. Ankit, uh, any example you would like to share? Yeah, so, you know, I'd break into two or three things. One is... Uh, you know, I think you have to be fundamentally, if you're in business, you have to play on the front foot. You have to play to win, right? You you cannot be defensive and you're not going to grow if you're defensive. Uh, that doesn't mean you do anything and everything. Uh, it means you are you do prioritize what, what are the investments that will possibly create the best bang for your buck. Um, and, and, and you move forward. See, in, in my industry, most of my competition are global companies, multi-billion dollar companies. And they probably have five to 10 times the R&D budget that I have. So I have to be, I have to still be on the front foot. I have to out invent them with probably one fifth the budget. And that's the task cut out. And the beauty of it is that it actually for me is much more on, on the culture, how do you drive the innovation rather than whether we should invest or not. That's a given that we have to invest. If I want to, my ambition is to be world top three in where we are. And for me, there's no option but to continuously innovate in, in what we do. So, so then it comes down to how do you drive the right culture of innovation? And then it gets into what is innovation, what is Jugaad and, and all of these language. Uh, one of the things that's worked for us very simply is you don't need a lot of these big bang, life-changing ideas. Uh, you know, and I think Aditya Ghosh, one of my friends said it, is if even if we can do a billion one dollar ideas, that works for us. Right. And so we don't need a lot of big bang. That's the same thing when I walk with my into my into the factories, work with the shop floor team is every day. If we can do something slightly better, uh, that's that's still a step forward. Right. And we really encourage people to come up with those ideas. And then the core, which is still a problem, I think, and we have to solve for that, particularly in India, is that how do you still uh, let people take risks on the shop floor, right, ultimately? Because when you come down to KPIs, ultimately only rewarded for positive performance. But how do you tell them with, with, with your heart in place that your failures are mine and all the success is yours? 
and and you really encourage them to to make that happen and you keep doing that you keep doing that you keep them how do you even celebrate failures which which a lot of companies talk about i think that's the trickier part to solve for so that people really come in and once you solve that i think even the talent that you'll be able to attract will be phenomenal where people come in and hey i can really try new things here and i'll, I'll not be kicked out of the company uh, for trying something that i felt was in in the interest of the company so i think that's something for me extremely important on uh, on the innovation i think overall um, i do believe i've, I've worked in, in in various countries around the world but but the the, the sheer will power the sheer sheer the sheer effort uh, the sheer energy that we have in our in our youth in india i really believe that we have a lot of the uh, you know table stakes to, uh, to be one of the most innovative countries in the world Thank you, uh, Rupesh. Coming to you. See, for me, uh, you know, when it comes to profitability, uh, first of all, uh, you know what behind innovation goes, you know, vision. Mm -hmm. You know, you are in some business, okay, and then you know you want to see how you can extend that business. You know, either you do a geographical spread to go across, or you, you know, you go on the invention mode where you say that you know I will, you know, look at how I can better something better. So, uh, taking the example of three years ago, mm -hmm. is where you know we were connecting people, you know, when it because using connecting as you know the uh, as the base on which we are working, what else if connected can help? So we looked at connecting things first, where we now can connect with machines and then machines can work remotely. And that is how that innovation helped us, you know, uh, you know in a big way. Matches was known that we need that. And then we took a step further, where we say that how can we connect with data, and then you know broaden the spread, uh, you know, and the usage of the product. So it is not necessary that you go on creating newer products. In my opinion, uh, you know, innovation happens pretty much within what you're doing every day. And you should just use your vision to solve bigger problems in life, and and once you are able to solve those problems for your customers, okay, uh, you know business is a given, right? So it happens, and you know more often than not, it it pays heavy dividends because mm -hmm. you are researching and you know investing in the area where there are solutions required. Sure. So as CEOs, uh, all three of you, I mean. Uh, are also in a way entrepreneurs and uh, Radhika of course you have walked that path you have been an entrepreneur yourself before uh, you sold the company to Edelweiss so there are a lot of uh, people in the audience who actually want to understand I mean as leaders when you are walking that path of introducing something new walking the innovation way how do you take the entire team along and uh, I mean act in those times as a leader and you should know okay in the future, how they should be prepared for what new is to come. So, I think before I answer that question, I I don't want to say one thing. Is that you know, they, there is the audience is full of entrepreneurs, and you know, we are probably celebrating the best of startup India culture today. Um, but innovation also exists in corporate India, and. Just because you are a CEO or forget CEO, just because you are an employee of an organization does not mean you are an entrepreneur. I, only, I fully, fully believe that entrepreneurship is a state of mind. It's not a state of employment. Um, and that, that has been my firm belief as I transitioned from entrepreneur to a professional CEO. Uh, I got a lot of comments in that era that you're selling your company. You know, you didn't have a boss. Finally, someone will become your boss. You know, you're not the owner anymore. That's a load of bakwash. I think finally, all of us are accountable to stakeholders, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you are a you know full-time CEO or employee. And all of us in a country like India have an opportunity to innovate in our industries and in our roles and in our line of work. So innovation can happen anywhere. It's not conditional on your employment. I think as a CEO, how you how you drive innovation. I think a lot of it comes down to how you motivate your team to take risks and what do you do if risks fail. I know Ankit also touched upon this point, but people feel scared to take risks because of the fear of failure. Um, and when there is a feel, fear, uh, when there is a fear of failure, you know, suddenly you see a sense of risk aversion. So 
as a leader i think you know i know when we were doing a product launch last year and there was a lot of failure about not taking off i said listen if it works uh the credit is yours and if it doesn't work i am happy to take the downside because i have a sense of what the downside is and i know the downside is not that bad sometimes as a ceo um you have more of an ability to step back and say you know the outcomes of failure are not so bad a lion guy will not feel that so i think how you incentivize uh, how you talk about failure um and how you take credit uh, for failure um is important the second thing is i think innovation needs a culture of open ideas um i truly believe that the best innovation now doesn't come from boardrooms it comes from what i call the battlefield it comes from the ground it comes from customers uh, one of the exercises that i do as a leader is uh, every 6 months i do a catch up with and we are about 300 people it's not a huge org but reasonable size i do a catch up with five people in a go of different teams and i don't speak in that catch up i just listen to suggestions um and uh, it's become a great format because i think some of our best ideas come from the ground so if you build a people uh, culture where people are willing to speak and you are open to listen you will find innovation in small small pockets in your organization Ankit, any lessons you wish to share with us uh, with regards to leadership? Ankit, we cannot hear you. Sorry, um, I was saying there's some some things I think you know a CEO cannot avoid. Number one is the CEO has to be extremely positive, not just positive. in whatever is going on you have to be the rock to to find the positivity in it because everyone is seeking their positivity from you and that's just a given in in, in my experience but also in and when i speak to my friends or anyone else so that it starts from that place and if you can okay i would request the team to uh give the login session again because i think they have logged out in the meantime uh, rupesh if we can yeah, have uh, the answer for you yeah i think you could have solved this problem <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, uh, see uh, in my opinion uh, uh, first of all uh, giving team the confidence that they will win you know is uh, and uh, you know imbibing you know really pushing them and being with them you know is the first thing i believe uh, you know to have an innovative team which will be successful uh, second point is um, i believe deeply in the principle of frugality okay where you know everybody talks of heavy investments yeah. okay things can be achieved you know by little investments also so how can you solve a problem not using too many resources you know is what someone should also look at mm -hmm. because that also gives you a view whether the innovation that you are bringing to the table okay is it can be do people really want the innovation or the jugad as ankit was saying you know some things work with jugad you know is that innovation really required and then to have that confidence and go on the front foot for example you know so we came in with a solution of augmented reality where we talking about the maintain people in manufacturing lines okay using smart glasses mm -hmm. now everybody will be like wow i mean this is so sci-fi and how yeah. can you use smart glass and build that solution and so on and so forth but when you really link it with the value it creates you know to the problem okay and you're able to solve it okay you're able to sell it number one and sail through along with your team to build a business case to monetize it so there, there. there are two parts to it one is the frugality as to finding you know simpler way of doing ah, it okay. and when okay. and when we are sure then don't hold back as ankit also saying play on the front foot right so once you are sure that the solution which you are providing is the one okay then just play with lot of confidence to the team play on the front foot and deliver it you know do you know because and too much analysis also leads to paralysis as they say you know just move keep moving and you will get there yes there will be 
uh, tweaks required there you know there will be an evolution you know but you will get there you have to be persistent with it and just deliver so Rupesh, uh, I mean, are you also uh, partnering with startups in any way to drive this innovation with Team Viewer? Yes, so uh, multiple areas, the way we are creating an ecosystem, you know, where uh, we can create value for our customers. So startups definitely uh, come in with a lot of fresh blood from, uh, from experience and, you know, the knowledge that they bring to the table is immense, right? So uh, there are there have been areas where we've partnered, uh, you know, with uh, these entrepreneurs to really create newer models, okay, which customers can adopt to. So, for for instance, uh, now EV is the next big thing, okay, and there are a lot of startups who are doing EV charging stations, right? So, uh, there, you know, they came up with a thought that you know if there are EV stations all over. Can we do a remote connectivity to make sure that all EV stations are up and running all the time, charge, you know? So those ideas are coming in. We've created a platform, but startups are coming with ideas as to how you can leverage the platform to create their own solutions. So startups are creating solutions on top of TeamViewer as well. So that is how we are also growing in the, and creating the ecosystem, uh, which is for everyone. Okay, interesting. So, good to have both of you back. So, Ankit, you were sharing some lessons with us on leadership when we lost you. Yeah, I'm in the connectivity business, so I'm particularly upset that we lost the connectivity. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think what I just spoke of in terms of the, the how critical it is to be, uh, you know, positive uh, and optimistic. Um, I think clearly from, from uh, you know, culture perspective, I fully agree uh, it's not just for you know entrepreneurs or uh, you know startups to be in a certain mind frame i think all all companies have to be uh, you know looking at it i mean in fact we've we've seen clearly that you know five year 10 year strategies have almost become meaningless uh, you may broadly want to have a view of you know where you want to get to uh, but really we have to relook at the details probably every you know 6 to 12 months uh, the way the the market and the volatility is happening and global events are happening um, and then that's a little bit linked to agility. Uh, I mean, I think that's that's something that, uh, you know, typically you find that as companies scale up, certainly as, as small companies, uh, startups scale up, uh, you typically want to put in those processes and systems uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, you're ticking the boxes. But then how do you just still balance that uh, with quick decision making and, and moving forward? Because there's really nothing worse uh, than kind of thinking through too long over taking a decision. Very often, even a bad decision uh, or a wrong decision is is not as bad as just you know sitting on something for too long, um, and then I think the last part I would add is uh, you know I think <laughs> my own my own style has been towards a bias for action, uh, and by that I mean yes you can have a certain strategy charted out, uh, but really I find that the biggest challenge uh, uh, for me personally has been just the execution, uh, just getting the top talent on board absolutely aligned towards execution within a certain time frame and really running it in a project management style. I would really encourage, uh, you know, even the entrepreneurs and others in the audience to disproportionately focus on building those tools and capabilities towards the execution uh, rather than overly thinking about, you know, some breakthrough idea and all of those. Because uh, we've seen enough cases where you just, you don't, you don't, you don't have the challenge on the idea, but far more challenges on the execution on the ground. So I think that's a skill set I would strongly Recommend the same for innovation or anything else you're in your core business. Uh, I would say disproportionately have a bias for, for the execution. Sure. Another question I want to ask you, you is, uh, is STL in any way driving innovation while working with startups? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can think of probably eight or ten ways, uh, but in context of, uh, of time. Um, so we're actually doing some very interesting things on in AI and ML, for example, where to reduce our scrap rate, we're using a startup uh, to, to look at, uh, you know, through visual inspection while our manufacturing is going on, whether there's a scrap so we can, uh, we can catch it early and then avoid the scrap later in our process. That's one example. We're working with many uh, logistics startup companies for looking at how to minimize our time and our cost. Uh, I just gave this example of global logistics how we are able to map again using uh, startups. We're also looking at startups on the on the hiring and recruiting side 
where again now there are AI ML uh, machine learning algorithms to go through CVs and 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 be able to uh, create the fit for you uh, in an automated way. So many such examples. Uh, and again, it's not, it's it's never come up with an intent that we must use a startup or a large company. It's always been what's the need, what's the budget, and and who can who can serve this for us as fast as possible. And and more often than not, we're finding startups come to the table, and and uh, you know step up. What I also appreciate uh, with the startups is they're much more open to customize and 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 create things personalized for you rather than saying here's my brochure, you know, take it or leave it. And, and I, I really feel more and more corporates are looking at it. I don't think we're the exception. Um, so I would, I would encourage the entrepreneurs to, to not kind of undersell themselves. Uh, and I said, be on the front foot, approach the corporates and, and, and find ways to work together. Sure. Radhika, any uh, I mean, uh, innovation which you have brought with startups uh, at Edelweiss? You know, to be honest, we haven't had the opportunity to work with uh, too many startups uh, simply because I think, uh, you know, in the asset management business, uh, we've largely worked with established players. That said, I do think that because there has been an absence of startups serving our industry, there is perhaps a very large opportunity because the old players, whether you look at registrar and transfer agents, whether you look at analytics providers, uh, Etc. are old age players. So someone who brings in agility, someone who brings in technology and someone, the differences in financial services also is able to be regulated and command the regulatory loopholes. Actually, there's a very powerful proposition. So I always say that, you know, if I were to start a startup, I would not start one in asset management. I would start one as a service provider to the asset management industry. Uh, either as a you know registrar and transfer agent or as an analytics provider. So no, I don't think we work with them, uh, and there are not too many serving our industry. But I just think that there's a tremendous amount of potential for people to come forward. Okay, sure. So with this, I would like to throw open the floor for questions. And before we lose the connection with our uh, other two panelists, please raise your hand if you have any questions for any of our speakers. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Daksh Singhal from XLRI. Uh, the question is to all the panelists. So we had a chat about innovation and how you as CEOs are trying to implement it in your companies. We talked about uh, companies accepting the failure and the cost of innovation. Um, can you please talk a bit more detail about how do you transmit that information to your employees down the line? How Can do you repeat you? the last part last of the line? question, transmit information? So how do you transmit that information or that sentiment that the company is going to support and is going to um, sort of absorb the costs which will involve uh, the required innovation or the failure of it? I can take, uh, I can take uh, a jab at it. Um, you know, I think it's just uh, for us, it's just been by, of course, you communicate it. We do it very actively in, in, our, in our town halls, uh, for example, which is one supporter. Uh, we do it when you visit the factories on shop floor. And, and it's just, you know, you have to keep repeating it. But also, I think you have to demonstrate it. So, uh, for example, uh, one of our values at a company is hunger to learn. So we will, we will in our town hall, give examples of, of teams that tried something different, which could have had a very meaningful impact uh, to the business. And for a variety of internal external deals, it didn't work out. And we will still reward them uh, in, in a public forum. And it's not about the monetary reward itself as much as A, recognizing that there was a sincere effort put. And B, that it's okay even if it didn't work out. We appreciate the sentiment with which you put put your you know life into it and, and try to make it successful. So I think it's just, a you know, with, with anything and when you're trying to drive a certain behavior, you have to just keep repeating it, you know, continuously. 
uh, and again keep an open mind into if if you're of course if you continuously seeing trends that that people are trying things and not being successful then you have to go a level de- deeper into what else you can do to enable that to be successful because obviously whether you like it or not it does impact your you know personal your company morale so you want to create you know good wins so celebrate the wins but also then keep showcasing where people put in their best and may not have worked out so that's that's been my experience yeah i tend to agree with ankit i think you know uh, often uh, when innovation is expensive i remember during the bharat pawn time there were constant questions on people's mind why are we doing this this is loss making etc i think your own conviction your own optimism shows in the communication uh, and very often i think companies don't communicate about this they don't like taking the questions i think being open and taking those questions that are on people's minds because just because you don't talk doesn't mean the questions don't exist the questions will exist when you're open to talking about them when you're open to communicating your vision for that which they're not going to buy into maybe at inception but they'll buy into some will buy into it 6 months later some will buy into it a year later two years later i think optimism and conviction i think people can read it through your body language which and we, we give them less credit the second is how you actually react to failed innovations i mean you know the language you use the words you say do you put pressure on people who have failed do you penalize them uh, or do you celebrate them as he said through town halls and other exercises uh, but how you react in that particular moment i think often determines or culture is usually not determined i mean we do values days and uh, you know we do town halls where we award values but i don't think and we write it on our wall but i don't think culture is finally shaped by that culture is often shaped in the day to day so uh, you know uh, when you talk obviously i agree with ankit in terms of town hall communication especially in larger organizations where there is a recognition on everything that is happening it by some things which are really giving you heavy dividends so some things which are not working as as much however uh, you know uh, when it is an inno organization which is led by innovation okay uh, it is not binary or black and white okay every exercise that is done you know reaps some benefits to the organization an organization recognizes that so you might not get the end result but you st- certainly gets some learning out of that which is put to use and recognizing that is what i think we've been able to do uh, and that has uh, led to a lot of um, uh, you know excitement uh, amongst research- researchers or even uh, people those who are working on the field to constantly tr- keep trying doing something you will lead somewhere not every innovation you know all of us know the startup story right only 2 or 3% actually uh, go there where where they want to go but that doesn't mean that others are complete failures so we we promote that any more questions uh, hi my name is saheb uh, i want to ask the panelists that uh, i have a challenge that i uh, i face a challenge that i want to know that how the corporates tackle so basically i have a new company i am a, uh, a very young person i am 22 years old and i have an infrastructure company uh, we have operations across pan india but i want to know that uh, while uh, like i always am a believer that you know corporate rules systems and processes should be implemented in startups so that everything is in order and if uh, things go without processes or systems that that is usually the case with all the startups so th- we make losses or there are a lot of things that goes by that the ceo cannot see when there are very different teams working so if we implement those systems and processes and we are smaller in team like 30 40 or 50 so the final deliverables get delayed a lot of times because um, people are very matlab if there are multiple teams uh, set up and everyone has to follow a written set of protocol and rules so the final deliverable is usually delayed or there's some problem in that so do you face those challenges and if yes then how do you tackle those yeah i'll take this one uh, so uh, in my uh, tenure as a uh, you know as a uh, business consultant i have uh, seen this uh, you know in varying occasions and uh, i always uh, you know make one comment that you know don't take an antibiotic just because you sneezed okay so uh, you have to play 
on your strengths, okay? Especially the strength of a startup is being flexible, is being agile, okay? Than a established or a very large enterprise, right? So the strength being flexibility and agility, you have to play on it. If you create too many processes within the company, I'm not saying don't create processes, but you have to evaluate. If you're creating too many processes that is causing the delay, you have to rethink the whole model and simplify, okay? More often than not, you will find that, you know, you are trying to run your company like a large enterprise, which is not required, okay? Uh, like, you know, Ankit will agree, you know, Starlight Technologies for that matter did not implement all the processes day one. It evolves. So go with the evolution, go step by step, and don't complicate things, simplify. And it doesn't mean that everything has to be done in the system. There are easier ways of doing it. And, uh, you know, experience will teach you. Uh, you know, that is what I would say. Go stepwise, don't complicate things. Thanks. Yeah, okay. just to, to add, uh, <laughs> I think uh, it, it's, it ever evolves. I, I, I would be wrong to say even this morning if there was something I thought should have been done and it wasn't done. Um, I think the big shift I have, I have seen personally in myself is probably, you know, versus even three, four years ago where I would, you know, go after the, the person or the individual. Um, a, a lot more now for discussions happen, okay, for, if something was not delivered to a customer or, or any other part of the business, uh, what part of the process was broken and what can we do to fix the process? And it's always open-ended question. I think that's probably we're moving into leadership style. Uh, but I, I think that's extremely critical to understand what questions to ask and how to ask the questions from your team, because you don't need to come up with all the answers and you're not going to be able to know what process to set up all by yourself. So just again, it comes back to what are you aspiring towards? Where do you want to scale up? And then clearly, as I said, we don't need to have everything you know sorted out on day one. No company does really. And even where we are at, we've been in business for 30 years we're still going to evolve, right? The ambition is to grow 10x from here. We will need a lot more processes. Uh, but, you know, you got you can't wait for everything to happen at one go. And I think the more you can involve your team to, to drive and fix those processes rather than do everything yourself, uh, the better odds of your success. Radhika, anything I, you want to add? Because you've seen both sides of the world. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I came, I came from a startup world where virtually there was no process and I saw a lot of frustration when I moved to a corporate environment where uh, there was a lot of process. Uh, and now I perhaps, I mean, I am, uh, perhaps run a business which is the most regulated industry in India. So we have the maximum number of mandatory processes and yet I still think we are a very agile company. So I just want to make a point that while yes, cut down the number of, you know, processes, even if you have a lot of mandatory process, agility is a state of culture. Agility is an important part of culture. Very often when we see, it's not the process that slows people down. It's interdepartmental politics. It's a lack of ownership. It's a lack of a guy in a back office function feeling that he needs to do this quickly because sales is really not his thing. So a lot of it gets caught in a trap of culture. Um, I think if you have a lot more interdepartmental conversations, for instance, is where different processes are, uh, where you push people to realize that why they're doing thing in one day rather than seven days actually matters to the consumer, even though they are not consumer facing. If you do things like this, even while having a certain amount of process, you will build agility in an organization. So the only point I want to make is that agility can coexist with process if you fix culture. I think with this, we would like to conclude the session. I would like to thank both of you and Rupesh for joining us offline and both of you taking out your time and joining us and logging in again. Thank you. Thank you.